If you watched our videos on transformers, then you know that they are a powerful, complicated tool for natural language processing. But if you've only watched my videos, they're not enough. You're not going to fully understand what's going on. I'd strongly recommend the annotated transformer to actually go through the implementation. Link in the description. The first version was by Sasha Rush while he was at Harvard, but it's since been updated by other folks to conform to modern PyTorch. But there's a lot of information here. It might be a little overwhelming. My goal in this video is to go through five details in the implementation of transformers that are pretty important, are covered well by the annotated transformer, but I didn't really talk about in our previous videos. If you haven't checked those out, I'd strongly encourage you to do so. Link in the description. First up, positional embeddings. Unlike the RNN or LSTM, where the structure of the network implicitly encodes the order of words, Transformer doesn't have anything like that. So how does it know what word is where? Positional embeddings. Just like how normal embeddings tell you what each word means, positional embeddings tell you where words are in the input sentence. So how does it do this? The original transformer used trigonometric functions with different frequencies depending on the index of the vector. Here's the equation where pose is the index of the token in the input, i is the vector dimension that you're trying to encode, where you're going to stick the result in the output vector, and d is the size of the representation, the total length of the vector that you're going to generate. So why is there both a sine and a cosine? It just shifts the curve over a little bit so that you can distinguish that things are close to each other with slightly different embeddings for the odd and even indices. For lower indices, the embeddings are flipping back and forth between minus one and positive one pretty frequently. This allows the model to capture fine grained differences, whether it's in the second position or the third position. For much higher indices, the curves move much more gradually, so you can distinguish between the start of a sentence and the end of a sentence, say. And there are lots of things in between for medium levels of granularity. But although that's how it's done in the original transformer, you can also just learn the positional embeddings from scratch. But that does take a little bit more time, and it also prevents you from running on inputs of a size that you haven't seen before. Detail number two, layer norm. Normalization or standardization is a standard tool in statistics. Let's say you have some data that take on an arbitrary range like this histogram. Benny got over 300 on the spelling test. Is that good? Hard to tell without knowing the full distribution, so we'll often subtract out the mean and divide by the standard deviation. Then the mean becomes zero and everything less than the mean becomes negative. So then you know that Benny's score, negative 1.4, isn't actually that good. It's more than one standard deviation below the mean. We sometimes call this a z-score because z is often used for the standard normal distribution. Doing this as a pre-processing step on a per-feature basis is useful in deep learning because if feature A has a much higher magnitude than feature B, it might wash out that feature, and it could cause your gradients to go wonky. For a batch norm, we standardize the given feature across all of our samples in a mini-batch. That is, for index 1, we compute the mean and standard deviation, then we create a z-score for that, and then use that for all of our downstream computations. This has been standard practice in machine learning for decades, both in deep learning and in, say, SVMs and logistic regression. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about layer normalization, where instead of doing standardization at the feature level, we do it per sample. Or in the case of transformers, after every layer. This paper goes through why layer norm is a good idea. It makes the distributions of intermediate layers more comparable. It enables smoother gradients, faster training, and better generalization accuracy. Detail number three, residual connections. One of the reasons I really like Mark Riedel's diagram of the transformer is that the residual connections are quite clear. Instead of only taking the output of, say, one feedforward submodule, we combine the output of a sublayer with the sublayer's input. This helps prevent vanishing gradients and make sure that backpropagation makes it all the way back to the lower layers. Detail number four, the optimizer. Speaking of backpropagation, transformers take a little while to get warmed up. Initially, 
the internal layers are just giving you nonsense. So you don't want the optimizer to get too committed to those representations. Thus, the learning rate slowly creeps up over time until you've got a good representation in your internal layers and then it slows down as you refine your representations. And this is a function of your encoding size and the number of warm-up steps you specify. Detail number five, smoothing. Ah, you thought that you could escape smoothing once we moved to neural models. Not so! Here, the question is how much does a loss function penalize a wrong prediction? So in the transformer, they use label smoothing. All the wrong predictions get a little bit of credit, while of course the correct predictions get far more. Here's a tiny example of this. The right predictions are in yellow, but you get a little bit of credit for everything else. And effectively, this means the model is penalized for being overconfident. Here's a plot of the loss versus the input to the softmax, e.g. x of x before you normalize. For a correct output, if you score really low, you pay a high price in the loss, but if the probability is too high, you pay a little loss as well. The sweet spot is, is right here. Okay, that's all I have for my little guidepost. Please enjoy going through the annotated transformer. Just like you shouldn't build your own electrical transformer or build your own transformer robot, you should probably leave the construction of transformers that you use on a daily basis to professionals. Understand it with these toy examples and the code from the annotated transformer and then move on to using an implementation from Hugging Face or something like that. We only talked about some of the details and it's very hard to get them right. And even if you did, you probably don't have the compute or the data to compete with the big players. But that being said, I hope this helps you understand transformers better so that you can use these massive models with confidence knowing that you have gotten the little details right this is just one video from a course that I'm teaching. If you want to get the whole context, check out the course webpage linked below. There you can find all of the videos in the right order. YouTube likes to show you older videos out of order, homeworks, exercises, and recommended readings. And if you want to help other people find videos like this, please be sure to like and subscribe to provide a big gradient to the algorithm.